praise the name of God. Uh, it's good to see you here. It's five weeks since uh, I was last here. Uh, the other time I was to bring the word of God to us, I was uh, taken down with a cold. I'm so grateful for Pastor Dan, who stepped in to serve us in that time. And so he helped us wrap up Exodus chapter 2 and really introduce us now to the Exodus. We're really getting now to the actions uh, in all these dramas. So we're beginning from three all the way. Uh, this week and next week, uh, probably the other week. We're not so sure, but uh, we'll see how it uh, pans out. We hope to come in chapter three, four, and part of five, just to help us see what God is doing through these people of Israel. Uh, while we were singing, I was tempted to look at Psalms 106, just to remind us again uh, what God is doing uh, through this work, but just to remind us that everything we are studying here is about God, our Father. And uh, if you look at Psalm 106, giving account of God's work among the people of Israel, We read from verse number 25. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. They performed his wondrous acts among them and miracles in the land of Ham. And goes on giving account of the things Moses and Aaron said. So we actually... If you are tracking this through Psalms 106, we are at that point where God is now going to send Moses. So chapter number three opens up with Moses in the wilderness of Media, taking care of the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. And so uh, what I'm going to do is just to walk us through that chapter up to verse number 10, which Pastor Dan has helped us read, sharing with us a few thoughts and uh, probably highlighting a few implications here for our practical application. So I pray that God will uh, speak to us as uh, we go on in this session. So it, the Bible begins by saying that now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Uh, and before we look at the second phase, you see, this is 40 years since Moses sought refuge in Media. He had started off as an ad adopted son, rather, in Egypt. Now he was an alienated shepherd in the pastures of Media. He had come out as a hopeful savior, you remember. But here he was as a helpless sojourner. We all remember that this was a consequence of his taking matters into his own hands and slaying that Egyptian. But that notwithstanding, the burden of alienation was so bitter, if you heard Pastor Dan read that context, you almost feel that, and if you read it in light of chapter number two, the burden of alienation was so bitter that he calls his son Gerishon which means I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. I have been a stranger in a foreign land. So he sort of names that son in remembrance of his years of estrangement in the land of Egypt. Moses was an educated man in the University of Egypt. And that's a detail we gather from history. He had enjoyed royal privileges for about 40 years before fleeing to Media, he was now a husband and father. Yet for 40 years, he had not only put up with his in-laws, but he also was pasturing their flock. Now you and I know, 40 years in the house of your in-laws for married men, eh? is not an exciting experience, but worse still, he had no updates on the lives of the people in Egypt, his people actually. He loved them, remember, 
He had hoped to free them, but there was nothing he could do about it. And that just added to his daily humiliation and frustrations in the wilderness of media. He had given up his adoption privileges, therefore he could not employ them to secure them. In fact, when he attempted to do that, it is his folly that turned him into a fugitive. And he's here because he cannot do anything to help his people. He was not even aware of the recent developments. He did not know that his people had finally reached out to God for help. And he did not know that God had responded positively to that cry. That's what Pastor Dan was carrying us through uh, last time he was helping us through the book of Exodus. You remember? And Moses is not aware. Moses is not aware that these guys have sent an SOS in heaven and the signal has actually reached heaven and God has responded positively in keeping with his covenant promise. Furthermore, Moses was not even aware that he was the divinely appointed vessel for the deliverance of, this, of his people. Uh, and he was not even aware that the 40 years in the pastures, just as the 40 years in the palace in Egypt were being used by God to prepare him for that kind of work. So he was living in oblivion all days of his life. And that's 80 years of his life. But all that was about to change. The cloud of uncertainty that engulfed him was about to be rolled back. That yoke of alienation just hung on his neck for eight years, or for 40 years at least, was about to be broken from his neck. The faithful God, as we heard, who is mindful of his promise, was on the move, even though he was not aware. He had not forgotten his servant, because we did say that God is faithful and not forgetful. So God had not forgotten that Moses was in the wilderness of media. Nor had God stopped caring for Moses since his departure from Egypt. We did say that God is caring and not called towards his people. And Moses is one of his people. And just as he was to the children of Israel, for the many years they stayed without looking above, God was still aware of their situation and was concerned and was con continually and constantly exercising loving care towards them, just as he was doing to Moses in the wilderness. So God had not stopped caring for his servant through all these years of alienation. Now, Moses may never have given voice to his humiliation as did his brothers and sisters in Egypt, but we did say that even those unspoken groans do not escape the ear of an attentive God. Remember, we did say that God is attentive and not absent-minded and so sensitive to the needs of his people, so aware is he to the cries of his people that he can be able to perceive even those deep groans of their hearts. And God had not failed to note the groans of Moses while he was in this wilderness. And so Moses was soon to learn that all his days in the wilderness, whether pleasant or painful, were altogether meaningful. For what had started off as a pursuit for refuge had become God's preordained means for training this deliverer ahead of time. So none of these things were just happening coincidentally. There was a lot of providential masses around the life of Moses. 40 years in the palace when he was adopted and preserved was God's preordained means to prepare him. 40 years in the wilderness 
were not just wasteful years, they were useful years in the arms of God. God was at work in keeping with his covenant promise to prepare his servant. And so these were not wasteful years, these were useful years. Now remember, Israel needed a savior to deliver them, but they also needed a shepherd to direct them in the ways of God and bring them home to rest. And God used the 40 years Moses spent with Jethro's flock to mold him into a faithful, patient, and compassionate shepherd. There was need of a faithful shepherd. There was need of a compassionate shepherd to take care of the flock of Israel. They had never known instruction from God for 400 years. All they had known is affliction and pain and gods not known to their forefathers, the gods of Egypt. And so beyond their deliverance, there was need for direction, right? There was need for someone to reveal to them the ways of God. And that will call for someone with the shepherd-like instincts, okay? To need almost a pastoral ministry to take care of those kinds of people. It's, it's the normal thing. When we have been languishing in sins and wasting away in depravity, upon salvation, we always need pastoral care, right? And, and God needed that kind of a deliverer. And these 40 years of shepherding, this little flock of his father-in-law were very useful in modeling those kind of instincts that were necessary to shepherd the people of God. In fact, it's recorded in the book of Numbers way later when Moses was dying. The Bible says in Numbers 27, 15, 17, then Moses spoke to the Lord saying, may the Lord, the God of the spirits of humanity, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come before them and lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Now, here Moses is speaking later on, having faithfully shepherded the people of God, but you can tell how he loved these people, how he had grown fond of these people, how he had been compassionately disposed towards them, and where did he learn all that shepherding thing? It was the 40, day, 40 years in the wilderness. It was during those years that his skills as a shepherd were honed up. And you know, all those years of taking care of the children of Israel needed all that preparation. So it makes sense why it took 80 years for God to prepare his servant. It makes sense why God took 40 years of shepherding someone else's flock under painful circumstances to model that kind of man. It makes a lot of sense when you see this in light of what Moses became to the children of Israel. It was clearly God's work, at work, so to speak, in media. So it was not just wasteful time Moses was passing. These many years of alienation were also God's means of giving him perspective, the affliction and the humiliation of his people in Egypt. Now, Moses had grown up for 40 years in the palace. He was clearly aware of what his people were going through. He saw it every day. His father, well, his adopted mother was a princess, right? So, presumably, his grandfather, eh? Pharaoh was the one propagating all these problems. And so he grew up seeing the oppression of his people. And it's clear probably the mother had given him instruction. Mothers are very interesting. They, he, she must have fed Moses on his identity and made him aware of the problem they are dealing with in captivity. Are you together? And so he grew up. That's why at some point, he became fed up with his sonship to the princess and decided to do away with it all together. But even though that is something he witnessed every day, that is not something he experienced in himself, all right? He had chosen to identify with the affliction, but he had not practically been able to perceive what it really felt like 
for them to be enslaved, for them to be humiliated the way they were being humiliated in the wilderness. And so what this almost similar experience, save for the oppression did to Moses, was to highlight the helplessness of both Israel and now the 40-year stretch helped them also see not just the helpless of Israel, even though now he saw their suffering in perspective, he was also very helpless to do anything about it. He was now, he'd become really aware of their problem, but I think the greatest thing he became aware of over time, especially after his folly, was his helplessness to do anything about these people. But that was a good place for Moses to be. Because these 40 years of inaccessibility and inability to attend to his people had taught him the humility of resigning from the flesh and resting in God's mercy and God's will. So there's a great lesson he learned. Just being unable to access them, just being unable to attend to them, it taught him a lot of humility. And years later, the humility will become a signature of his relationship with God and his people as he led them. The scripture says in the book of Numbers 12, th verse 3, Now the man Moses was, the very, was very humble, more than all men that were on the face of the earth. He had not just become a compassionate, patient shepherd, but the scripture characterizes him as the humblest man on the, man on the face of the earth. And all this had been worked in him by God during these many years of humiliation, during these many years of living with the burden of the desire to rescue his people and with the reality of the impossibility of doing it by himself. Those things taught Moses to begin trusting God and not himself. They brought him to a very good place where he daily, as a leader of these people, predisposed himself as a very humble man. It's very interesting. When I look at the life of Moses, I mean Moses, from this en the encounter we are going to see with God, moving forward in all Exodus journey, keeps on asking God for even the most obvious things. That's a humble man. A man who had learned not to depend on himself. And that was born out of those many years of affliction. And last but not least, these many years in the fields of media gave him a geographical perspective of media. It is in this very wilderness that he will lead God's flock and route to Canaan. And so even in a geographical sense, these years were meaningful, not wasteful. Praise the name of God. Those 40 years looked wasteful, but they were very meaningful. The God of Israel, the living and sovereign God, had destined all these years to wrap up the work he had begun doing in this man in the first phase of his 40 years in the palace. So the pastures were just as useful as the palace, or the palace was just as useful as the pastures. See, it is during the palace years that he became an educated man, and that education will go a long way to help him gather all the info that was necessary to combine the entire Pentateuch right, together. That wisdom was needed, that knowledge was needed. But the pastures were necessary to having prepared this law to be able to present it to people. He needed to be patient. He needed to shepherd them. He needed to instruct them patiently and carefully and compassionately. He was not to lord that law over them. He needed to instruct them in the laws of God. So both the palace and the pastures were very useful, and that is to say, all the 80 years of this man that seemed wasteful were very useful. Praise the name of God. 
And that was so because of who God is. He's the living God. He is the sovereign God. He's the God who is always at work to fulfill his purposes. He's the faithful God. And the first lesson we therefore derive from this text this morning is that God's goodness and mercy is what covers our weakness. That sort of comes out of this life of Moses, that God's goodness and mercies is what covers for our human weakness or covers our weakness. Now, whether this weakness is due to our sinfulness or this weakness is due to our humanness, we are weak all the same, like Moses was. Cindy, we are not different from Moses. We are prone to wander because of our sinful nature and make fatal choices the way Moses made. I mean, we make very funny mistakes and sinful things, not just mistakes, just the way Moses did because of the proneness we are to sinfulness. And if God were not faithful, let's be honest, we will all fall out of this race. Praise the name of God. We stand and abound in this race only because God is faithful. Many are our sins. We have kept on saying here or singing that our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. If the Lord were not good, if the Lord were not merciful, if the Lord were not faithful, you and I won't be here. Moses wouldn't have lived to see 80 years and be called as we are going to see. And all that is also to help us appreciate as the children of God, those of us who are chosen, those of us who belong to God, that we stand on account of God's goodness. We stand on account of God's faithfulness. And that should encourage us, even in our battles with sin, our struggles with the flesh, to know that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. And in that goodness and mercies, even our weakness of sinfulness is well taken care of. And we can walk boldly on this path, knowing that the Lord has our back covered. But not just that, we are powerless in ourselves to secure and to steer our lives through this world. It's not easy to live in this world as Christians, right? We are all powerless to deal with the day-to-day -day battles in this world, both spiritual and physical. There are always things fighting within and without. And if God were not faithful, if God were not good and merciful, if God were not who he is, you and I will perish. We won't make it. We stand only because God is. Praise the name of God. We are because he is and not the other way around. We are surrounded in this world by irresistible pleasures and innumerable perils capable of just grounding our faith. And if God were not faithful, we will all fail. We can't keep up with the irresistible pleasures that surround us all day long. We're prone, we're vulnerable. But praise be to God. Praise be to our Father. Praise be to him who called us and chose us in Christ, that he is faithful, therefore we will not fail. We can rest in that. Praise the name of God. So, tied to this reality is another fact also, that God's delay does not mean God's denial. It is Thompson Boston who says that, that God's delay, that every child of God should remember that God's delay does not mean God's denial. It may, be, it may seem that God is late when he shows up, but he is always on time. As Pastor Dan taught us the other time, he was helping us to see the subject of prayers and the faithfulness of God. Now remember, people like Abraham and Sarah had 25 years in between the promise and the fulfillment, but 25 years late, 
was still God's right time. Remember Martha and Mary, those two wonderful sisters of Lazarus. They sent an SOS four, no, four days in advance. Christ did not show up until four days later, but those four days later were not late. Praise the name of God. It was right on time when he showed up. Forty years late in Moses' case. But even then, God was still on time. And the people we are dealing with, the people of Israel, it is 400 years later when God is showing up. But even 400 years late was still God's right time. And that should really, really encourage us because it still reminds us what we learned in chapter number two, that we ought to go on Praying without ceasing. The scripture that says in the book of Luke chapter number 18, when Jesus Christ is giving that parable, that men need to go on praying and not give up. Because God's delay does not equate to God's denial. Should you and I find ourselves waiting on God, let us remember that after we have prayed, Trusting in him according to his will, that delay is not denial. Let us keep holding the line when we have lifted that cry to him. However long that takes, because God knows the things we have need of even before we ask. Furthermore, God hears us when we pray. Even more still, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or imagine. Probably the groaning of Moses was, God, I just need to get out of this humiliation of living in my in-law's house. These routines of waking up and taking the flock out. But God did much more than that as we are going to see. And what about the ordinariness of life? Just take the story I mentioned of Moses. For 40 years, Moses spent doing the same thing, the same way, in the same wilderness, shepherding the flock of his in-laws. He woke up like the good shepherd and showed up at the sheep pen on time for the morning roll call. He led the flock out to the pastures and looked after them all the way till evening. Then he brought them back to the safety of the fold and went to bed to prepare for the following day. And that was his life. Every day, every week, every month, every year for 40 years. There was no fun in the usualness of that service. But now, seen in light of God's purpose and faithfulness, these years were very significant in his life. And the same can be said of you and I. It is very hard to imagine if your life is worth anything with regard to the kingdom. It is possible to feel that you are only as godly as when probably you are doing something Christianly unique. Maybe in a crusade at the end of the month or something spectacular somewhere. But it is these days we spend in offices doing usual things, days we spend in our homes doing the usual things, We're always dealing with problems every new day. And so whether you are staying home and working from home, or whether you go to the office and work from there, sometimes this usualness, this ordinariness of life can become boring and sometimes life feels like it doesn't make sense. Many a times I've sat by the way and thought, how did this Mama Boga serve the Lord? Because, you know, have you ever imagined? They wake up in the morning, go to the market, get the Bogas, come back, they cut it, prepare, afternoon they show up, and it seems that life has just taken an ordinary spin and life seems to have no meaning. Let's remember, looking at the life of this man in ordinariness of its application 
God was at work in all these things, and these all were prepared by God for this man to make much of the time God had given him. There's nothing strange with what you're doing in the office, but there's something significant God is doing with all that things you do. And so let's give ourselves to faithfully labor in our ordinariness, knowing that the Lord is in the mix of all this. The Lord is in the midst of us, and he's at work. And when you perceive weakness of any kind, should you falter because of sin or suffer for boredom due to usualness, remember that it's the goodness of God and the mercies of God that cover for our weakness. Praise the name of God. Now the Bible continues to say, And Moses led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. This was like, I mean, this was a day like any other, again, in the life of this shepherd. He needed pasture for his flock. He knew where to find it. As a good shepherd, he knew if you go to the valleys in the mountains, you will find green pastures because the crowds there are very fertile. And so again, Moses was on his ordinary routine. And so he led the flock to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now the depiction of Mount Horeb as the mountain of God is so because Moses is writing in retrospect. You see, this is a book, this is something he's writing. He's, he, he's looking from the end of the journey, he's looking back into everything that has been happening, and he begins putting everything together, and he, he perceives, oh, this, this thing was very significant, and it meant something in the eyes of God, in the plan of God. So it is not that he came here because he knew that this was the mountain of God. No. But as he looks back to God's work among his people and in his life through the entire Exodus journey, he sees that this is a significant landmark and he calls it the mountain of God. Now, of course, this is because Mount Horeb is actually Mount Sinai. Are you together? It's the same, same mountain. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 20 affirms that, remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and that I may teach their children. He's at Mount Horeb. If you read Exodus 19, 10 to 11, you see the same thing now in reference to the same mountain. Is using it as Mount Sinai. Are you together? So it is at Horeb that God first appeared to Moses. It is to this mountain that he brought God's people to worship after delivering them. It is at this mountain, remember, that God made a covenant with the children of Israel. In other words, it is here that God met with his people and it's at Horeb that God's people met with God. So this was a very significant landmark. I may be right probably to say that this is the second most significant mountain in the history of God's work with his people, coming second only to Golgotha, where another interesting covenant was established and another exodus took place. Praise the name of God. And so, again, what began, now notice, just as he's leaving Egypt, what began as a human longing to guide the flock to good pasture becomes the divine leading to guide Moses to the meeting point, the mountain of God. So Moses woke up to his usual routine. He wasn't expecting anything spectacular that day. But God was at work, and what was unknown to him, that his longing was actually God's leading and steering him to that meeting point this particular day. God had already planned this. Moses was absolutely oblivious of this, but God was undeniably in control of all that was happening because of his covenant. And so as soon as Moses showed up at Horeb, 
the mountain of God. Two profound things happened, none of which Moses expected, as we have said, but all of which, as we continue observing, were sovereignly predetermined by God for Moses to experience. Praise the name of God. First, God shows up and speaks to his servant to reveal his glory and his grace with regard to his covenant. The second thing that happens, God sends out his servant to redeem God's people and to bring them to their rest in Canaan. Two things. Number one, God shows up and speaks to Moses to reveal his glory and his grace with regard to his covenant. And secondly, God sends his servant to secure his people and bring them to the safety of Hannah. Praise the name of God. So that's the two things that happen. Now, these two divine initiatives reveal that this meeting was inevitable. It was absolutely inevitable. It, it just had to happen because it was to happen. Even though Moses was not aware. And again, that really spells out God's sovereignty in our lives. The things he has ordained to happen. That's why we rejoice, we who are born again, in the salvation of God, because we are chosen. We were chosen before the foundations of the earth. And so the day when by God's grace we answered that call, it was only an affirmation of an inevitable reality. Praise the name of God. That's why salvation is a thing that should cause a lot of celebration in the heart of any believer. So God had planned when? God had planned where? And God had planned how this meeting was going to happen. Because God was in control of his life. Now look at how Moses responded just to appreciate this. Moses was first struck with wonder when God showed up. And we're going to see that. But soon this graduated into worship when God spoke up. However, when God said to Moses that he was the chosen missionary, you could almost see Moses work in protest. It's almost like, mm -mm. God, well, I love your purpose. It's eternal. It's perfect. God, I love your plan. It's good plan. I mean, you're going to save my, I've been longing for the salvation of my people. That's a good plan. But I don't like the choice of the person you have made. I think the missionary choice is the error you have made in this case. And we want, I want to reserve that story of the missionary and his reaction for next week. Okay? And focus on the first two as we bring this to closure. The Bible says, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not being consumed. And so Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not being consumed. And so when God sees that Moses has turned aside to look, God said to Moses, 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 and he said, here I am. Now, God showed up in that context that we just read, in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. Now, the reference, the angel of God, is not to be understood as the created messenger, but as the creator himself. We see that designation elsewhere when God shows up to comfort Hagar, concerning the subject of Ishmael. You remember that Kabush experience of Hagar and Ishmael? We see that designation also when God appears to Abraham and Ruth to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see the angel of God mentioned in that. Stephen recounting this event in the book of Acts chapter 7 verse 30 onwards also designates this as God. And in our context, verse 4 and 5 assigns attributes only used of God to this angel to tell us that we are not dealing here with a created messenger. We are dealing with God Almighty 
himself. So it is proper to say God appeared to Moses in a blazing fire. As a shepherd in the wilderness, Moses had seen several bush fires. I mean, that's a commonplace thing in the desert. Therefore, there was nothing spectacular with a burning bush. But upon close examination, Moses realizes something unusual with this fire in relationship to the bush. The fire was burning the bush, but the fire was not burning up the bush. Or the bush was not burning up. The bush was not being consumed. And the biblical explanation to this unique phenomenon is simple. That was God's presence. Praise the name of God. The blazing fire was God's presence. Now later on again in the book of Exodus and all through the scriptures, fire is going to be used as an emblem of God's presence or of God himself. Let me read a few texts just to confirm that. Exodus 19.18 Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly because God showed up again in fire. Blazing fire. Exodus 24.17 the sight of the glory of the Lord was like consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Again, God showing up in form of fire. Deuteronomy 4.23, Moses warns the children of Israel, take heed to yourselves, yeah, it's Moses, lest you forget the covenant the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves carved image in the form of anything which the Lord our God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 9.3 Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy the enemies and bring them down before you so shall you drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. And later on in the New Testament, Hebrew appealing to the saints says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably and reverently with godly fear, for God is a consuming fire. Now notice, those warnings goes both to the enemies and to the saints. Praise the name of God. It's, he is a consuming fire to the enemies, but that does not mean the saints should become casual with him because he is that consuming fire. Praise the name of God. So, however, on this particular day, God was not out to consume his servant. Thanks be to God. The aim of God this particular day was to capture the attention and commune with his servant. The attention of his servant and just commune with him. The purpose of God was also to bring to his, or rather to bring to light his glory, not to burn his servant. God had a lot of these kinds of meetings lined up for Moses. This was just the beginning. Moses is going to really experience a lot of this fire incidents with God. In fact, it's going to be, again, another signature of this Exodus journey. Praise the name of God. And so, his intent was to draw Moses to himself, not to drive Moses away. To help Moses appreciate him as the consuming fire for sobriety in service. Now, that's something that Moses need, needed to know. But at the same time, have Moses experience him as a compassionate God. So there are two things happening here. The consuming fire is showing up and not blazing, blazing upon that bush and not burning. And Moses is drawn near to God and is not consumed. Because in this moment, 
God wants to proclaim his glory as the consuming fire and also his glory as a compassionate God. As a relatable God as well as as a fierce God. And those things are very important for the work Moses was going to perform. We know that the most prominent theme about God in Exodus, both under the law and under grace, the Exodus of the grace, is that justice is the justice of God and the mercies of God. Those two things go together. The goodness of God is always preached also in the backdrop of the severity of God. It is Paul who says, behold the goodness of God and the severity of God. He consumes as well as compassionately salvages his people. Praise the name of God. The preeminence of God and the immanence of God are things that always go side by side. Pastor Dan has been get, taking us through the book of John. And what we see is Jesus Christ on the one hand as a lion and on the other hand as a lamb. And so these twofold pictures of God, emblems of God, are always in the story whenever God is in the picture. Yet nothing lights up the compassionate heart of God more than the word God speaks next. The Bible says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals for your feet, from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Praise the name of God. Now notice something. God calls Moses by name. Now, and even though the tone was urgent with an object of restraining him, a lot is revealed in the fact that God knew Moses by name. Now, this guy had lived in oblivion for about 80 years. For God to show up and call him by name, that was significant. That was very personal. That God knew his, him personally. And that's very important for you just to think through as I pass over that point, that God knows you and I personally. Again, in our years of waiting and struggles, just remember that our God knows us. Praise the name of God. It's impossible to miss out the love of God in this. Considering Moses' years of, of oblivion, a kindness that is continued in the text, in the next word that God spoke. For God still not wanting to consume this man, commands him to desist from moving closer to him. Now that was an act of mercy. Praise the name of God. There was nothing wrong with drawing near to God itself. There's nothing wrong with that. And there is nothing wrong for you and I coming near to God or coming closer to God. But there is everything wrong with the coming to near God in a casual way. And that's what God needed to take care of this at, in this moment. And God himself, remember Moses, Moses' attention is now focused. And he wants to draw near. And just God urgently cries out or calls out to him, Moses, Moses, and then wants him to stop coming near. So God himself explains this fact for Moses. He says, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now, Moses will probably think, well, what, what makes this ground holy? These are the mountains I bring the flock to. In the course of the year, he probably showed up several times in this place. So, what makes this place holy? This is me imagining, because of the next thing that God says. He says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now that expedited everything. Just notice what happens. For 
In that moment, Moses did not only remove his sandals, but Moses also hides his face and does it quickly because he's afraid to look in the face of God. And why? It just dawns on Moses that he's standing face to face with the holy God, the God of Israel, the God of his father. And that therefore, he is indeed standing on a holy ground because he's standing in the very presence of God. And so it is the holy God that changes everything in that moment. The God of Israel was not new to Moses. Moses knew about God. He had been raised as a Hebrew, even though in a palace. And he spent much of his years with the Hebrews, learning the history and God's dealing with them. He knew his background well. That's why in the course of time, he rejected his adoption, remember? And he decided to join the affliction of, in the affliction of Christ. That means he was aware of who God is. He had not seen him in this light. He had never encountered him, but at least he knew who God was. And he revered him. So that even when he was coming out of Egypt, he was not oblivious of who God was. So the foundational reason for his alienation, remember, was rejecting his adoption because he identified as a, a man of God. So the act of removing his sandals was akin to laying aside the contaminations contracted while walking in the ways of sin. Well, that's what it really means, the removing of the sandals. What God is calling Moses to do is to symbolically, this is another emblem, the removing of the sandal. God is just calling him symbolically to remove the filth of his sinfulness while he's been walking in the ways of sin. He's been corrupted. He's been contaminated. And the act of removing the sandals was an act of reverence whenever men due to God in worship. It shows both reverence and it also reveals their awareness of their sinfulness. And therefore, that outward ritual sort of shows their inward acts of repentance. So this is what is happening here. And the point is that God is holy and righteous. The glorious God who never changes, the compassionate God, is the consuming fire. Now, last week, Pastor Dan showed us something in the book of John. The Son of God shows up and they have turned God's temple into a market place. And he prepares a whip and he whips them out of the temple because they are defiling the temple of God. And that shows their attitude towards the holy God. And that's the same thing that is happening in this context. God is inviting Moses to stop in his track and for a moment consider that he's not just standing in any other ground. He's standing on the holy ground. Hebrews tells us, let us have grace so that we may know how to approach God acceptably. We may be able to approach God acceptably because the Lord our God is a consuming fire. And if the first lesson, as I come to conclude this, that we learned was that God's goodness and mercy covers our weakness, the second lesson we go home with as we come to conclusion is, it is God's glory and love, that, or rather God's glory and love calls for our reverence. Praise the name of God. So his goodness and mercies, even though it covers our weakness, his glory and love calls for our reverence. And that's very important, a thing for us, to remember, I've said I will want to spare the rest for next week uh, because the other point ties with that. But I just want us to go home from this service thinking through this fact that when we consider the glory of God, when we consider the love of God that has invited us to himself by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, we need not forget that this glorious God is a holy God, that this gracious God is a holy God. And maybe just for our 
practical application in this church. You may understand that lately a lot of things have been happening, a lot of good and exciting changes. I don't know about you, but all is in the bid to communicate this to us. That even our gathering here on Sunday is a very sacred thing. Now, we don't believe that this building is holy, but we believe that you and I, who are the body of Christ, are holy, and that when we gather together, we gather in the name of God, and the Lord is in our midst, and the Lord, our God, in the midst of his gathered people is holy. Praise the name of God. And that when we gather here on Sunday, we are gathering, and once we have gathered here, nothing really changes. The building remains the same. But because we are here, a holy people worshipping a holy God, that changes everything. Now, we must appreciate that over time, something happened in the history of Christianity that threw us away from reverence and just invited us into a casual kind of Christianity. And that shows up in the songs we sing and how we sing, just shows up in the prayers we make and how we make them. That shows up in the way we conduct ourselves when we gather for worship and how we conduct it. It, it shows up in many, many ways. And what we have made effort to do as your pastors and elders in this church is to try to redeem us to a place where we begin appreciating that whenever we gather here for worship, we are gathering for serious business and not some casual engagement. That we are transacting with our holy God and not just any other person. Praise the name of God. And that therefore when we gather, we want to have that in our conscience. That the Lord our God in the midst of us is holy. That's why you've noted that even our prayer time, now they might look routinely boring, but they are inviting us to think of God like that. We just don't want to be the kind of people that show up in the presence of God, not thinking about God, and then just bubbling before God. Christ himself said he had, God does not entertain bubbling, repetitive bubbling. And sometimes people just gather in the presence of God and they assume, I think someone deceived us in the Christendom, that a lot of speaking and bubbling and making noise in the presence of God equals to spirituality which is a very deceptive thing that happened in the kingdom of God. I don't read that in the New Testament. I have opened the New Testament page. Last week, my wife and I were even visiting with a couple that was asking us the same question. And I've, I've looked at every single prayer in the New Testament. It's a very simple, well-thought, premeditated prayer prayed to a living God who is conscious, who is aware of the things they are praying. It, does, it is not noise. Even in the days of Acts, you remember when the Spirit showed up, the next prayer they pray when they are coming out of prison is not just noise they are making. They quote some and they are very logical in their discourse while they are praying. The point is, we are coming before a father who has ears that hear. We are coming before a blind father and much shouting, much noise will not attract the attention of God nor does it move any spirit of man to attend to the heart of God. And I think I want to share with us sincerely, brethren, that some of the things we have been practicing, including myself, because I've also been there, as we read the Bible, we need to learn the wisdom that we are learning from Moses, that we are approaching a holy God. And we need to keep in mind, as, Moses, as Solomon says, that God is in heaven and we are on earth, and that God is holy 
even though he's near with us. Bwana sifiwe. And we don't need to wake up not having thought. I always laughed at my campus years when I remembered. You know that time you wake up, throw your blanket off, and then you show up in the prayer room, and because you have not thought about God, you either begin statements like this, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. And you are warming up. You remember those statements? Father, we give you glory. Lord, we are here. You know those kind of things? Or someone who is blessed with speaking in tongues, they begin river centering and baba, just to warm up themselves and to, to get into the gear of pray. We don't do that in the kingdom of God. Prayer is needs being communicated to a listening father in simple and precise words. And so when you see us gathering here and screening for you items, we are not in any way communicating that we have become less spiritual because it is the spirit that inspires the scriptures and invite us to call on God best on those promises. Now, why? Because we want to approach God acceptably. Praise the name of God. We don't want to entertain activities in church that will pit God against you. And I know some of us are hung up in the former experiences, hoping that we can bubble, we can make those noise. Or just saying, based on the scriptures, I think we need to wake up to that reality. Bona si fiwe and enjoy praying. Haven't we enjoyed meeting every Friday just to lift prayers before God, brethren? When I see few Isn't it enjoyable when you know you are talking to your father and you know he's listening to you because you are talking to him in according to his will? Praise the name of God. I have grown to appreciate in my journey of discipleship that when someone gives me a prayer item, I need first to ask myself, what is the mind of God on this? And that certainly invites you to begin thinking about God. And once you know the mind of God, you're able to voice that with understanding. Praise the name of God. That goes also with singing. Just don't wake up having not thought. And you begin singing. It doesn't work like that. When I see few, I think much of our music has been noise and we need to accept that. And this is my pastoral appeal to us as the church, that as we examine the scriptures, we are becoming more convinced that the best way to approach God acceptably is to feed us the word of God and to help us plan music that is gospel centered, biblical centered, theologically sound to help us facilitate worship. Praise the name of God. Because we are worshiping a holy God. We are worshiping a righteous God. We are worshiping a loving Father. And we just don't want to show up before him having our minds closed and our hearts excited with emotions. When I feel it. Emotions are good. But emotions that are not governed by hearts are distract by heads are distracted. We need thoughts and emotions in worship. When I see few. And boy, it's, nothing is ever exciting in this church for me. Nothing is ever spectacular for me in this church. I've told Pastor Dan often time, when I'm standing here looking on that screen. And I'm hearing all of us lifting up voices in unison and saying in one accord, Behold our God seated on the throne, reigning in majesty. There's nothing more spectac spectacular than that. I would rather have that for the next 1,000 years than gather here just to make noise to the Lord. When I see few, that is richer, that is better, that is refreshing. I would rather have that a thousand years than have lights behind this screen trying to work out my energy to perceive God. When I see few, I would rather have that for us than have people screaming in microphones and shouting 
than have a team of choir members arrayed in the latest trends of clothes, trying to obscure the glory of Christ we are worshipping. I would rather tune our minds to God by the word and focus our hearts to God by the music we are singing. Because our God is holy. Praise the name of God. That is what we are attempting to do here as your pastors. And I think it is right for me to ask you to humbly accept our ministry to you because it is premised on that foundation. We long and desire to see a church that is sober, a church that is theologically sound, a church that is musically, I mean theologically sound in their music, a church that is theologically sound in prayers because we know that's what will serve you for the generations to come. One as a few. That is what will secure this flock in the right place. And so instead of battling with what is happening, how about examining the scripture and jump in and let us worship the Lord? The routines we make here when we lift prayers, it's not just joking. I don't go to my father at home in the village and say, Daddy, I was speaking, Daddy, have you heard me, Daddy? I wanted to tell you how wonderful you are. Daddy, you gave me money the other day. Daddy, you know you are so good. No, my father will wonder, what is wrong with you? Don't you think so? I mean, can you imagine Esaf coming to me as, Daddy, Daddy, you are wonderful. Daddy, Daddy, I'm wonderful. Boy, what do you want to tell me? Just tell me what you want. Tell me, I am your uncle. How will you feel when I come as your son to your home? And I begin shouting at your door. I think you will feel respected, even as a father, when I show up, greet you, and then talk to you, and ask of you what I need, right? Uncle, I have come to, you told me the other day you have purpose, but you will be coming for them. And I come and ask you for purpose. I don't need to shout to uncle for uncle to give me purpose. That's why I need does it look like I'm now unspiritual when I speak like that to God? If anything, I'm so sober, I'm so spiritual. So what we want to entertain in this church is such a Christocentric, biblical, biblically authentic kind of worship. When does he feel it? For the generations to come. When does he feel it? So we invite you as our, your pastors, whom you have entrusted us with responsibility, and God has given us this mandate that we may show you the way of God. What does he feel? Or we long that you will stop probably fighting within yourselves and wondering. If you've been wondering, it's just because we believe our God is holy. What does he feel? We believe that the goodness of God invites us to revere God. What does he feel? We believe that the grace of God requires us to reverently come before him in worship. We believe that the kindness of God requires sobriety in our fellowship. When does he feel? Let us not be caught up in what I will call, or what is commonly called charismatic chaos. When does he feel? Just being chaotic in worship. It doesn't serve, it doesn't edify. The Lord is holy. And we want you to think like that when you come here every Sunday. That's why we ask you to prepare. That's why we send you documents every week. It is us inviting you to begin thinking seriously about the God you are coming to worship. Praise the name of God. That's why we send you songs early. It's because we want you to come here having thought seriously about God. You see, when God spoke, Moses responded in reverence. Are you together? And why we want you to spend time with those documents we send us is because we equally spend time in prayers, meditating upon the will of God, longing to hear what the Lord wants us to do every Sunday. And so when we send them, they have been born out of humility, they have been born out of prayer, they have been born out of sincere love for you to prepare you for some sincere encounter with the Holy God. When does he feel it? So you will do well to prepare yourself. You will do well 
whenever you are given any assignment in this church, even to lead a prayer, like Maina when was praying for this. Why we call you in advance is because we don't want you just to show up and pray. Are you together? It's because we want you to think seriously about the will of God as you pray for that particular item. When I see you. That's what our Sunday school teachers are doing, and God bless them. You've seen Diana laboring with women, our Sunday school teachers, prepared material. Why? Because we know the God we worship, and we want us to worship him acceptably. Praise the name of God. So brethren, whenever you are assigned any responsibility with regard to worship, take him. Amen? Prepare. Even reading the scriptures, you just don't show up and open there. Bible. Take some time, think through it, because you are coming to proclaim the word, to read the word of God to us, okay? And so you want to have your frame of thought clear. And that's not ritualistic, that is spiritual. When I see fewer, that's as our spiritual act of worship to a living and holy God. So I pray that you will begin reading the voice of the Spirit in everything that is happening and stop struggling to understand. Amen? May the Lord bless you. We are very sorry if we never explained this clearly earlier on. But we just hoped we will demonstrate to you long enough for you to be able to see what we are seeing and join us in what we, are, we believe the Lord wants the church to be doing. That's the vision we are casting for you in worship. Amen? So I pray that when we gather next Sunday, when we show up on Friday, that we will stop everything and concentrate on God.